shall we pray as we come to God's word? Father, thank you for the book of Ezekiel. Father, thank you um, that even though it's tricky, there is much to learn from it. And Father, pray that we would do this evening. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, some years ago, when I was a student, it was popular to talk about how complicated the book of Revelation is, as we've been discovering on a Sunday morning. Uh, Hardest book in the Bible, they would say. And my usual contribution to that conversation would be, you're only saying that because you've not read Ezekiel. But actually, having said that now, I think I'd be, uh, I'd, I'd be saying, well, you've forgotten Zachariah, even if you've read Ezekiel, but thankfully Steve is doing that rather than me. But you might gather from just bits that you know, Ezekiel is a hard book. I mean, we've been saying, haven't we, that the book of Revelation is as if Ezekiel wrote a gospel. But what was Ezekiel trying to say? What is he doing? Or what was God trying to say through Ezekiel? Well, thankfully, as with Revelation, Ezekiel does not exist in a vacuum. Ezekiel belongs to a long line of Old Testament prophets. And his message, as we'll see, should agree with what they are saying. If Revelation is New Testament truths in Old Testament language, then Ezekiel is Old Testament truths in Old Testament language. And indeed, we'll find the same themes running through his writings as we find in others. The failure of Israel's rulers, judgment on the nations, the religious life of Israel, and their eventual restoration after the exile. Ezekiel may seem big and scary, but really all he's doing is talking about the same things that the other prophets are talking about. Ezekiel is telling his story in the midst of it all kicking off with the exile. He himself was a Levite priest who was exiled by the Babylonians with Judah's king, uh, Jehoiachin. And he's been in Babylon for five years when he starts to prophesy. At this point, Jerusalem is still in one piece. And Zedekiah is there on the throne. He reigns in uh, Jerusalem, but he's Babylon's puppet and he won't be there for long. Soon Jerusalem will be ransacked and everybody will be exiled. And that is what Ezekiel is talking about. We won't have time to look in detail at basically everything in the book. This is quite a long book. But let's dig in. So first of all, Ezekiel has a vision of God's glory. A vision of God's glory. Generally, if people know anything of Ezekiel, it's the bit at the beginning. I think it's because they read that and then they give up. But uh, it's a vision of a throne on wheels within wheels, with eyes and angels with wings and four faces that move in all sorts of different directions. And Ezekiel tells us that this, uh, this is a vision of God's glory. Now we could spend the next two hours on that chapter quite easily, but for now let's just see that that chapter teaches us that God's glory is movable. It's got wheels, it can go in different directions. God's throne is not restricted to Judah. God is no tribal deity limited to his territory or turf. God's glory is wonderfully and gloriously mobile. And his field of vision with all those eyes goes way beyond the land of Israel, across the whole world. And this vision causes uh, Ezekiel to fall flat on his face. But God commissions him to be his prophet to his people as we have read to us before. He's given a scroll to eat and he must proclaim the message to the people of Israel. If that sounded familiar as Lewis was reading it, it's because it's repeated in the book of Revelation where John is given a scroll to eat. But we see in chapter 3 that Ezekiel is made a watchman for Israel. He's proclaimed warnings and if he proclaims the warnings that he's given, even if the people don't listen, he'll be innocent of their blood when they are judged. But if he doesn't proclaim the warning, there'll be a sense in which he's responsible for their blood. Which is a sobering thought for us as New Testament believers, as we've been given a message to proclaim as well. The message, though, doesn't begin abroad, like it might do with some prophets. It begins at home. And the first section, from chapters 4 to 24, is addressed to God's people. You'll notice, again, throughout, the pattern follows a very similar pattern to the book of Revelation. This would be the sort of parallel section with the seven letters to the churches. So our second point, judgment at home. Throughout this whole section, Ezekiel is given some rather weird things to act out. He's to lay on his side for over a year, eating bread that's been cooked on dung. 
And that's to show the whole nation's forthcoming exile in an unclean land. He's to clap his hands and stomp his feet as a vision of God's anger at his people. He's to pack his bags, dig a hole in the wall and leave through it to show how the people will be exiled and how some of them will try and sneak out of the siege of Jerusalem but still be captured. He is told that his wife will die but he won't be able to mourn to show how life will continue even as the exile occurs. And in between all these sort of actings out, God speaks out his judgment on his people. Ezekiel condemns princes, elders, false prophets and people alike over and over and over again. He tells parables about eagles and vines and swords. He gives laments about the princes of Israel who are now no more. This is part of what makes Ezekiel quite difficult, is that it's not just one genre of literature, not just one type. There's laments, there's prophecy, there's parables, there's all sorts of stuff going on. And significantly, in chapter 10, we see that he speaks about God's movable glory again. But here, the glory ups and moves out of the temple. So I'll read this to us, Ezekiel chapter 10, 18 and 19. Then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house, and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth before my eyes as they went out with the wheels beside them. And they stood at the entrance of the east gate of the house of the Lord, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them. We see there that the glory of the Lord has got outside the temple and is now looking east to where God's people have gone into exile. It's a bit like in 1 Samuel where, where the glory of the Lord departs when the temple is plundered by the Philistines. Well, here it's the Babylonians that will do the plundering, and God removes his glory from the temple in judgment on his people. And the judgment against his people really culminates in chapter 24, in what's really one of the most shocking chapters of the Bible. I once had a Muslim friend uh, point me to this chapter and tell, told me that there was no way that I could believe it was the word of God because of the shocking stuff that it contains. But it is. And it tells the story of Israel and Judah as the story of two sisters, Ohola and Oholibar. That means her tent or sanctuary, and my tent and my sanctuary between the two. Oh, uh, Ohola is the northern kingdom of Israel. Oholibar is the southern kingdom of Judah. And both are pictured as betrothed to the Lord. It's a sort of expansion on chapter 16 where Judah was pictured as an unfaithful bride. Ohola is unfaithful with Assyria, but in the end she's shamed by her own lover. He strips her naked, kills her children and then executes her in the, in the streets. When Oholibar sees this, instead of remaining faithful, she decides to be unfaithful too and actually pursues a relationship with Babylon. And God promises that as happened with Ohola, the northern kingdom, so will happen with Oholibar, the southern kingdom. And the very next chapter, chapter 24, Jerusalem, we're told, is besieged by Babylon. The end that Ezekiel has been promising has begun and will be completed in a few chapters' time. But there is hope, though. The end of chapter 11 promises new hearts for Israel. The end of chapter 16 promises a new covenant for Israel. The end of chapter 20 promises a return to the land for Israel. And they're all picked up in the last section of the book. But before we get to the last section of the book, there's another one in between. Judgment Abroad, chapters 25 to 32. Ezekiel prophesies judgment in this section on seven surrounding nations. Again, that idea seven often in the Bible to do with completeness. And again, we're supposed to see that God is not a tribal deity. He is judge of the whole earth, not just Israel and Judah. All the mentioned nations were eventually conquered by Nebuchadnezzar in one way or another. There are two extended sections on Tyre and Egypt. Again, we could take up the whole evening just looking at those two. Tyre seemingly gets a longer section as they sought to capitalise on Jerusalem's downfall. So Ezekiel 26 verse 2. Son of man, because Tyre said concerning Jerusalem, Aha, the gates of the peoples is broken. It is swung open to me. I shall be replenished. 
now that she is laid to waste. So it's like they're monopolising or uh, capitalising on what's happened. Egypt is picked on because of the way that they treated Israel throughout. For both of those two, there's a prophesy, a prophecy of the downfall of the nation, a lament for the nation, a prophecy of the downfall of the king, and a lament for each of the kings. In uh, the mention of the king of Tyre, he's talked about like Satan. It's actually sort of the only concrete information we get on the origins and the fall of the devil. The king of Egypt, Pharaoh, is talked about like a sea monster, another picture of evil in the Bible. They're a fascinating read, but you probably have to do this in your own time, but that's what they're uh, picking up on. But what they do do is raise the bar of what Ezekiel is talking about. This is judgment not just on the nations, but on evil itself. And these judgments point forward to that. But again, there is hope. There are two verses just slotted in about Israel in this section, at the end of verse tw uh, chapter 28. It says this, Thus says the Lord God, When I gather the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered, and manifest my holiness in them, in the sight of the nations, then they shall dwell in their own lands that I give to my servant Jacob, and they shall dwell securely in it, and they shall build houses and plant vineyards. They shall dwell securely when I execute judgments upon all their neighbours who have treated them with contempt. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. What God's saying is that they will return, they will come back home. Whereas God is judging the nations around them, he will bring them back. And that's the last section that we see, a restoration of glory from chapters 33 to 48. Before Ezekiel can speak of the glorious future, we return to the picture of Ezekiel as a watchman. He's back where he was in chapter 3. He has a message for the people. Turn and be saved. But the people of Israel do not listen. The people of Judah do not listen, even though Ezekiel's word seems to reach them. And Jerusalem falls. They're struck down in chapter 33. And it's the same as Isaiah, the low point before the high point. And boy, will it get high uh, in Ezekiel. In chapter 34, he denounces the leaders of Israel, but then promises a new shepherd. A good shepherd who is both God and a new David. A son of David who's also God, who will be a good shepherd. Hmm, I wonder where we're going with that one. Of course, it's the Lord Jesus. When he calls himself the good shepherd, he's almost certainly referring back to this passage. But that's not all. There's the promise of a return home after the judgment of our enemies in chapters 35 and 36. God promises to judge Edom, the descendants of Esau, pictured here by Mount Seir, a mountain in Edom. The mountain, their mountain, will be desolate and bare. But the mountains of Israel, on the other hand, will be inhabited and they will be cultivated. The people will return to their home and the people will no longer bear the reproach of the nations. But it gets better. The people will also be given the Holy Spirit and forgiveness. He promises in chapter 36 to put his spirit in the people. A spirit that will help them live the holy life, the lives that God wants, his Holy Spirit. He promises to give them new hearts to take away their hearts of stone and give them hearts of flesh. He promises to increase the size of the people and settle them in the land. He promises to cleanse them of their iniquities and forgive their sins. But he also makes really clear why. Ezekiel 36 verse 32, It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. God here is not working, well, he's working here for his own purposes, his own holy name. They have not earned God's gracious treatment, far from it. But God is gracious to them anyway. This is based on God's kindness, not on their goodness. Which again, as New Testament believers, should encourage us, shouldn't it? We are the beneficiaries of what it's talking about here. We are the ones who've received the promised Holy Spirit. 
We are the ones who have new hearts. We are the ones who really know sins forgiven. But it, was, but it was not because of our goodness or obedience, but because of his kindness and mercy. That's why we receive those things. But it doesn't even stop there. He promises new life in chapter 37. Here we have a valley of dry bones. An army lies dead on the floor. And yet Ezekiel speaks the word of the Lord and the spirit enters into them and flesh reappears on them. They form back into living beings. Again, there's so much going on that we could talk about here. It's like Eden again, where God breathes his spirit into Adam and he becomes a living being. But it's talking about God sending his spirit, spiritual life into believers. But we also see a clear reference to the literal resurrection that is to come, don't we? And equally on top of all that is a passage that speaks about the return from the exile. A nation reborn, resurrected, settled in their own land, reunited in the second half of the chapter. We've only got one song about this one, it's them bones, them bones, them dry bones. It does not do it justice. So much going on. And then finally God promises through Ezekiel in chapters 40 to 48, a new temple. Now these are probably the most controversial and confusing chapters of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is given great details about a temple that is seemingly never built. Some then put this off into a time in the future, and hey, that's not an awful idea, at least it takes what's written seriously as something literal, and that would again explain the immense detail that we're given. But I don't think that's what we're supposed to see here. There are several clues that should be able to help us understand what's going on. Now, I wrote a much longer section here, but for the sake of time, we'll keep it brief. Firstly, Ezekiel was a priest. The temple was a huge deal to him. And remember that one of the visions that he saw was the removal of God's glory from the temple. We start with God's glory. God's glory goes away. Well, in chapter 43, we see that God's glory will return. Ezekiel 43 verse 5, And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. In terms of the themes of the book, this is promising to restore what had been removed from the temple during the exile. God's glory will come back. And then secondly, we need to understand what a temple is supposed to be. A temple is like a new Eden, where God dwells with his people. There are animals in it, golden jewels in it, even a river in it in Ezekiel. It's supposed to remind us of Eden. And think where that idea goes in the New Testament. First to Christ, the one who is the greater temple, whose side flowed with blood and water. And then secondly to the new creation at the end of the book of Revelation. And if we follow that pattern that goes through, if Ezekiel is sort of the same as Revelation, well where Revelation finishes with the new creation, here this one finishes with the temple. And Ezekiel here is told that he's going to see a city, but he sees a temple, a new Eden, which is a whole city. Revelation shows us a city in the shape of the holies of holies, but with no temple in it. Why? Because it is a temple, spoiler alert for a few weeks' time. God is dwelling in it with his people. And we can look forward to that uh, for the whole of eternity. So really it's a picture, yes, of what's to come, but something much bigger than just another building on top of a hill. Well, I think we've run out of time there, so I'm going to stop there. But let's pray that God uh, would help us to understand what we've got here and also help us to give thanks to the Lord Jesus who so clearly pointed to in the book. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you that he is our good shepherd. Father, thank you that he sent his Holy Spirit. Father, thank you that because of his cross, we can know forgiveness. Father, thank you that he's a one king over the whole world, that we might be united together. Father, thank you for all the wonderful ways that we see this through the book of Ezekiel. <clears throat> And Father, pray that in our own time, in our own studies, help us to understand more of what uh, an amazing thing it is to have Christ in our lives. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.